exploring how we can master ourselves by looking at how authors and experts say it is possible with your host, Shashiti Basu. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 85 of How to Be With Me, Shashiti as your timid presenter, guiding you through life's tricky topics and skills by reading through the best books out there. Many people describe themselves as perfectionists. It can be defined as having excessively high standards and being overly self-critical. It also involves a tendency to set standards that are so high, they either cannot be met or are only met with great difficulty. Perfectionists tend to believe that anything short of perfection is horrible and that even minor imperfections will lead to catastrophe. So why do we hold on to perfectionism despite its flaws? We were lucky enough to hear from author of The Rosie Project, The Rosie Effect and The Rosie Result, Graham Simpson, on his views, as well as producer and host of broadcast and owner of social media company Tenkai, Clara Tulisic. My wife, who's a psychiatrist, would say that my perfectionism stems from a desire to look good and therefore only applies to things that other people are going to see, including this recording. This is my 33rd attempt at it. As a writer, it's largely served me well. You really can make a manuscript better with just one more pass. What I have to do is balance that against my desire to meet deadlines, which is also a part of looking good. And over time, I've managed to resolve that. It also means that what the editor sees is my best effort. All the low-hanging fruit is gone, and whatever they add will be theirs rather than something that I could have done myself. As a manager, which is what I did before I was a writer, it was more of a problem. I was inclined to project my desire for perfection onto my staff, and and I'm sure that made me a bit of a control freak. But here we are, right on 60 seconds. I didn't know I was a perfectionist until I had to write seminar papers in college, and it weighed so heavy on me as I didn't feel anything was good enough and I always had to change something. At one point, I even started writing seminar papers after the deadline. Such behavior continued in my early works in marketing because no matter what I did and what I learned, it never felt good enough, so I didn't even talk about my accomplishments. And unfortunately, I even left things unfinished. Uh, For me, perfectionism is closely related to the imposter syndrome and procrastination. However, luckily, I didn't give up. I continued working. I continued learning about my job, but I also continued learning about perfectionism. And now I'm much more aware of what perfectionism is, the emotion it brings, and how I can deal with it. And knowing all of that makes my work life so much easier and so much more productive without procrastination and feeling like I'm an imposter all the time. Our first book is from Catherine Morgan Schaeffler, who is a psychotherapist, writer and speaker, and former on-site therapist at Google. She earned degrees and trained at UC Berkeley and Columbia University, with postgraduate certification from the Association for Spirituality and Psychotherapy in New York City. The Perfectionist's Guide to Losing Control, A Path to Peace and Power, is her first book. It was great speaking with her, hence here is a snippet of our chat. But find the full interview on www.howtobe247.com or on the YouTube channel. I am a perfectionist. I didn't always think of myself as a perfectionist, but in doing so much work with perfectionists and then taking a step back and looking at my career from 30,000 feet in the air, I saw that perfectionism was actually in so many different clinical contexts and that the dynamics of it were in me. And so that really spurred so much curiosity in me about what is perfectionism and what makes someone a perfectionist. And I looked to academia and the research and wasn't fully satisfied with what I found. We all agree that the research on perfectionism is in its infancy. And so there's not a lot of language describing the kaleidoscopic multidimensional force that perfectionism is. And that was so frustrating to me. So I thought, well, why don't I try my hand at naming some of these patterns that I'm seeing in my clients across all these different kinds of contexts and putting language markers to 
what I know about perfectionism. So I wrote the Perfectionist Guide to Losing Control to really start this conversation that I want everyone to continue having and that I don't think has an ending. The mainstream approach to perfectionism right now is to tell perfectionists some version of just don't be so much of a perfectionist. And the subtext of that directive is just be less of who you are. And that doesn't work. It doesn't work for a lot of reasons, but mostly because perfectionism is a natural, innate human impulse. And I think it's present in everybody. People who are perfectionists experience that impulse more often than not and in a patterned way. So the difference between someone who's a perfectionist and someone who's not is just degree and frequency, really, of this universal impulse we all feel, which is the way I describe perfectionism. It's noticing the difference, the gap between the reality and some kind of different version of reality, a reality in which is perhaps improved or better it's a unique cognitive capacity of our species that we can perceive what's happening around us, but also imagine things in a worse off way and imagine things in a better way. And perfectionists are people who notice that gap between the reality and the ideal and who feel this real compulsion and real active quality to try and bridge the gap. And perfectionism can be healthy and it can be unhealthy. And healthy perfectionists understand that the ideal is not meant to be achieved, it's meant to inspire. And unhealthy perfectionists can sometimes lose sight of that. So will perfectionists stop punishing themselves by understanding, one, that punishment doesn't work, and two, by understanding that self-compassion is actually the thing that's going to help them do all the things that they're trying to get punishment to help them do. So let me back up here. My definition of a punishment is doing anything to create more pain for yourself in order to motivate you to change. And that's all punishment does is it lays pain on whatever's already there. We choose punishment because we don't understand that it doesn't work. And not only does it not work, that it makes everything worse, we also don't understand that we have other choices. And so punishment is really different than discipline, different than taking personal accountability. It's different than allowing natural consequences to unfold. It's different than rehabilitation. All those last four things I just mentioned require a degree of thoughtfulness and intention and taking reparative measures and there's a proactive quality to a lot of those things. Punishment is just reactive. And punishment just seeks to create pain. Punishment is lazy. And so a punishment is when you purposefully deny yourself something that you know is going to help you, or you purposefully do something that you know is going to hurt you. With the grand plan of like, I'm going to make myself hurt so that I can get better. And we don't heal by hurting ourselves. You know, language really helps me. It helps me to graft what I'm thinking, feeling, experiencing onto words and just creating space for my experience to bounce back and be able to gauge, oh, is this what I'm feeling or is it that? And th there's power in language. La language can really help contain some of our experiences and validate them back to us. So I offer the five different types of perfectionists because all the language around perfectionism is about how it's bad and unhealthy. And for women in particular, you need to stop being perfectionistic and be more balanced. And there's a lot of, again, encouragement to eradicate this thing, which requires a lot of energy and doesn't work because research confirms this, perfectionists experience their perfectionism as an enduring identity marker in the same way that someone might think of themselves as an artist or a romantic or an activist. That's how people think of themselves when they think of themselves as a perfectionist. And so in the same way that I wouldn't tell someone who's a romantic, listen, just take your belief in love and knock it down 30%. and You're going to be good. 
that's not how you approach that. You say, there's nothing wrong with being a romantic. I love it. I love a romantic. I'm a romantic myself. This is amazing. This is wonderful. Enjoy it. Also, you need boundaries around this or it's going to get really unhealthy. And so that's what I tried to do with perfectionism is just to say, what a beautiful quality. I love working with perfectionists. I love this like ceaseless drive. I love the force and power and undercurrent behind this construct that is really propelling so much forward motion and energy. And also we need boundaries around this. Otherwise it's going to get out of hand. The author says the phrase, there's nothing wrong with you. It's often disliked in therapy because people generally don't seek therapy to hear that they're fine. Most individuals believe that they are worse off than they realise and come to therapy hoping to discover the extent of their brokenness. They want professional consultation to confirm their jagged defectiveness and help them navigate the world with their perceived flaws. However, the author disagrees with this approach. They believe that investing energy in a pathologized version of oneself is unnecessary and hinders healing. Instead, they aim to shift the focus from weakness to strength, correction to connection, pathology to phenomenology, fear to curiosity, reactivity to proactivity, eradication to integration, and treatment to healing. The author argues that perfectionism doesn't have to be a struggle and being a perfectionist doesn't mean one cannot be healthy. They encourage individuals to embrace their perfectionism as a gift and show how it can serve them. They want to help individuals understand their perfectionism, which may feel burdensome, can actually be a tool to help them. They also emphasize that individuals themselves are gifts to the world. The author acknowledges that not everyone may be ready to accept this perspective or to grow. They recognize that perfectionists have an inherent desire to ascend, test limits and challenge themselves. They invite readers to explore the possibility that their perfectionism exists to aid them in their journey. Perfectionism can manifest in various ways and the impact it can have on one's life. The author shares her experience of being a perfectionist and how she initially resisted it but later recognized its power and value. She also discusses her own struggles including a cancer diagnosis and loss of control which led her to reevaluate her relationship with perfectionism. She emphasizes that anyone can be a perfectionist, even if they're not aware of it. There are five types of perfectionism, according to Schaeffler. She begins with describing the classic perfectionist. So classic perfectionists are highly self-disciplined individuals who present themselves in a uniform and controlled manner. They value structure, consistency and high standards, offering others what they themselves cherish. While they may appear unapproachable, they are transparent about their preferences and broadcast their perfectionistic tendencies. However, they struggle with adapting to schedule changes and find spontaneity stressful. Their need for control can hinder personal growth and limit connections with others, leading to superficial and transactional relationships that leave them feeling excluded and underappreciated. Parisian perfectionists have a strong desire to be liked and form ideal connections with others. They care deeply about how they perform and what others think of them, but feel embarrassed about their need for approval. They hide their perfectionism, striving to appear effortless and not trying too hard. They invest emotional energy into everything they do and expect validation and connection in return. However, their defense of irreverence can backfire as they fail to articulate their needs and wants. Despite their desire for meaningful connections, they can be blindsided when others don't perceive them as they want. When they learn to express their caring nature, set boundaries and embrace reciprocating relationships, Parisian perfectionists can thrive. Procrastinator perfectionists struggle with starting tasks unless conditions are perfect. They fear the loss of perfection once they begin, leading to hesitation and a sense of paralysis. They have a strong awareness of their talents and potential, but struggle to take action and compare themselves to others who are achieving what they desire. They mistakenly believe that their lack of starting is due to a lack of desire or discipline. Procrastinated perfectionists can become self-loathing and critical, and their hesitancy prevents them from showcasing their true abilities. However, with awareness, support, and a shift to an active mindset, they can unleash their potential and experience liberation and motivation. 
Messy perfectionists find joy in starting new projects but struggle to maintain momentum unless the entire process feels as exciting as the beginning. They often take on numerous projects but abandon them due to unmanaged perfectionism and disregard for resource constraints. They reject hierarchies and believe everything can work out simultaneously. While they possess tremendous gifts, focus is crucial for their success. Messy perfectionists may not always desire to finish what they start, but learning to channel their enthusiasm and focus on one thing at a time can lead to great accomplishments. And finally, intense perfectionists strive for a perfect outcome and are highly focused on achieving their goals. They can become frustrated and angry when things don't go according to their plan, projecting their high standards onto others. They prioritize the outcome over the process and struggle to find value or meaning in their achievements unless they meet their exact expectations. Intense perfectionists often neglect their health and relationships in pursuit of success, may struggle to connect with joy and purpose. However, when they learn to manage their perfectionism, they can become inspiring leaders who maintain their high standards while finding fulfillment in the process. Embracing different perspectives and appreciating the gifts of various perfectionist profiles can enhance life. Collaborating with intense and classic perfectionists can lead to success in entrepreneurship, while inviting a messy perfectionist can help with tasks like home staging. Each profile has valuable gifts that, when honed, allow perfectionists to live authentic and joyful lives. Celebrating perfectionism is key to unlocking its power. The author also believes perfectionism is often simplistically viewed as negative, leading to various frustrations and mental health issues. However, researchers have identified two branches of perfectionism, adaptive and maladaptive. Adaptive perfectionism offers numerous benefits, such as higher self-esteem, work engagement, and well-being, while maladaptive perfectionism leads to negative outcomes Mainstream discourse tends to focus on the negative aspect, overlooking the potential positive aspects of perfectionism. Rather than trying to eliminate perfectionism entirely, it is more effective to manage and understand it. Everyone has perfectionistic tendencies about something. When those tendencies, the desire to bridge the gulf between an ideal and reality, present more often than not, and are accompanied by the impulse to actively strive towards bridging that gulf, you can consider yourself a perfectionist. She also believes operating under an illness model of care and pathologizing doesn't just carry powerful implications for the way we conceptualize perfectionism. It impacts the way we conceptualize every aspect of mental health. Schaeffler says, when you stop resisting perfectionism, you're practicing non-resistance. Engaging in non-resistance frees up energy. You are the person responsible for directing where your newly liberated energy goes next. If you direct your energy in a curative and intentional way, you can build a life that you want instead of a life that feels hard all the time. Our contemporary view of balance is based on the notion that your life could ever fit on a to-do list in the first place, and that once you finish the to-do list and match your problems to their adjacent solutions, you can expect to feel a satisfying click. If you haven't experienced the clicking yet, it's because you're not being balanced enough. Being balanced has become synonymous with being healthy. However, balance isn't real. It doesn't exist. It's just an idea. The opposite term is said to be being a hot mess. Our culture seems to embrace, celebrate, and syndicate female perfectionists when their perfectionism is expressed through improving and decorating the home, hosting social gatherings and tidying up, such as Martha Stewart and Mary Kondo. Schaeffler believes this is gendered, which is why she tells women, do not allow your ambition to be pathologized. Refuse to apologize for or disguise your insatiable desire to excel. Reject entirely the notion that you need to be fixed, as long as it does not harm you. Perfectionists live with a tension inside them that never goes away. Tension doesn't always feel good, but there's value in it. Tension energizes and stirs awareness. Tension catalyzes action. Tension makes everything more interesting. The ideals that perfectionists seek are not generic. They reflect an individualized, perfect vision of success themed around the highest priority for the perfectionist. For perfectionists, in adaptive perfectionism, healthy compulsive strivings are value-driven, fulfilling, and executed in ways that aren't harmful to the perfectionist or others. In maladaptive perfectionism, unhealthy compulsive strivings are not fulfilling, 
and they're executed in a way that can harm the perfectionist and others. Adaptive perfectionists are connected to their self-worth. When you know you're already whole and complete, as you are, you're operating from a mindset of abundance. You already have what you need and you feel secure. For adaptive perfectionists, striving towards an ideal is a celebratory expression of that security. Maladaptive perfectionists do not feel whole or secure. They feel broken and they operate from a mindset of deficit. Their striving is driven by the need to compensate, to fix what's broken and to try to offer substitutes for or try to hide what's missing. Perfectionism is a dynamic construct with various manifestations. Emotional perfectionism seeks perfect emotional states. Cognitive perfectionism desires perfect understanding. Behavioral perfectionism aims for perfect performance. Object perfectionism seeks external perfection. And process perfectionism craves perfect outcomes. Each type of perfectionism can be adaptive or maladaptive, depending on the context. Maladaptive perfectionism separates one from self-worth, relies on external outcomes and tries to compensate unnecessarily. It can lead to people-pleasing, procrastination, self-sabotage and isolation. Embracing authentic power and letting go of superficial control is key to managing perfectionism effectively. Perfectionism also reflects our natural desire to experience total alignment with our inner and outer worlds. It's an attempt to merge the ideal, embracing what's possible, with reality, embracing what is. The only way to fully bridge this gulf is to become present. When you're present, you embrace both what is and what's possible simultaneously. You're achieving an ideal, the ideal state of awareness. A telltale sign that a perfectionist is in a maladaptive space Dichotomous thinking occurs when the range of possibility is eclipsed by the extremes of a spectrum. There's no grey area in dichotomous thinking. For example, you've either succeeded or failed, you're beautiful or ugly, you're revered or the laughing stock. Everyone is punitive with themselves at times, but perfectionists take punishment to a whole new level. Punishment differs from discipline, personal accountability, natural consequence and rehabilitation. Punishment focuses on increasing pain and discouraging negative behavior, while discipline promotes structure and positive behavior. Personal accountability involves proactive and reactive responsibility, fostering trust and offering healing. Punishment is passive and lazy, lacking reflection or improvement. Natural consequence motivates through understanding choices, while punishment relies on fear. Rehabilitation seeks to empower and stabilize, while punishment aims to demoralize. Punishment is a form of coercive control and is ineffective despite its prevalence in our culture. Empowerment, not punishment, is essential for positive change. Self-punishments are often invisible, intangible and unconscious. Different types of perfectionists have their go-to self-punishment patterns such as rumination, dissociation, endless people-pleasing, interpersonal turmoil or arrested development. General self-punishments include negative self-talk, self-sabotage, self-restriction, denying simple pleasures and self-laceration. Engaging in self-punishment keeps us stuck in a cycle of repeating negative choices leading to pain and a lack of progress. To escape this negative mindset, perfectionists have to practice self-compassion. They have to remember that everyone makes mistakes and nothing is flawless. They have to shift their focus from what's wrong to everything that's right and all the future possibilities that will make things feel even more right. Self-compassion is not easy for perfectionists because they have such a low tolerance for anything they view as a mistake or less than ideal. It's also difficult for them because self-compassion can be a slow and non-linear process and perfectionists tend to prefer full speed ahead. But there are some guidelines to help perfectionists find compassion for themselves. First, you have to focus on the process, not the goal. You need to stop thinking, I'll be happy when I finally get this. Again, this isn't easy for perfectionists, but when you focus on the process, you can celebrate the little victories along the way. This will help create the positivity, energy, and confidence you need to examine your issues honestly and actually do something about them. Learning from your failures as opposed to beating yourself up for them will also foster self-compassion. Adaptive perfectionists fail forward. They see the lessons in their mistakes. They understand they can grow from these experiences 
and that growth will eventually help them achieve their perfectionist goals. Remember that everyone suffers can help perfectionists be compassionate with their own pain. Remembering that our own feelings, no matter how strongly we feel them, are not facts, can also help perfectionists shift their self-punishment to self-compassion. There may be days when self-compassion isn't happening. You just can't do it. That's okay. When those days arrive, you can connect with other people as a substitute. Connecting with others doesn't always bring immediate relief to anxiety, depression or shame. Sometimes the impact is felt in the future, but it is always felt. And connecting doesn't just mean talking and processing your feelings. It can be that. But support comes in many shapes and sizes. There are times when tangible support should be the first priority, like when someone needs housing, food or sleep. This kind of practical help is also valuable in a non-crisis situation. If someone asks, what can I do for you? Give them something to do, even if asking for help isn't easy. Maybe they can bring dinner or babysit or walk the dog. Paying for tangible support, like finally hiring a plumber to fix a leaky sink, or paying neighborhood kids to rake the leaves is also a positive form of connection. You can find physical support by connecting with yourself and others through movement and exercise. Biking, tai chi, taking a walk with friends, or joining a sports league are all great options. Going to a regular yoga class can produce two kinds of support, physical and community. Not only do the movement and stretching help your physical well-being and lead to positive emotions, but being part of a group on a regular basis also creates a sense of belonging that is critical for mental well-being. Traditional communities like church, parents groups, or recovery meeting will all foster that sense of belonging. But even a group chat, a newsletter, or an active and inclusive Facebook page can work as community support. Replacing the terms better or worse with different is another way you can adapt to your perfectionism. Instead of judging yourself and your achievements against others, just remind yourself they're different. Remember, we're all unique individuals, so you'll never replicate that other person's life or career that you view as perfect. It is also important to remember that even small amounts of self-compassion and subtle shifts in your mindset can make a big difference. Sometimes you only have to stop berating yourself for a moment and give yourself a few minutes of forgiveness to clear away doubt and depression. It's like turning on a small light in a dark room. Finally, perfectionists need relaxation and restoration, just like everyone else, in order to have enough energy to harness their perfectionism. This is difficult for perfectionists because relaxation can feel like doing nothing and that feels horrible to a perfectionist. If that's the case with you, engage in active relaxation like cooking, writing, dancing or diving into the favourite part of your job. To restore yourself fully, you'll eventually need some passive relaxation too, but that doesn't have to be sunbathing with your eyes closed or taking a nap. Reading something simple, watching light movies or taking time to eat a meal can all work as passive relaxation for a perfectionist. Our final book is from Reshma Sojani, who is the founder and CEO of Girls Who Code, a non-profit organization seeking to close gender gap in the world of tech. Brave Not Perfect opens up a new world to those women socialized from a young age to strive for perfection and please everyone around them. Here she is at a TED Talk. So a few years ago, I did something really brave or some would say, really stupid. I ran for Congress. For years, I had existed safely behind the scenes in politics as a fundraiser, as an organizer. But in my heart, I always wanted to run. The sitting Congresswoman had been in my district since 1992. She had never lost a race. And no one had really even run against her in a Democratic primary. But in my mind, this was my way to make a difference to disrupt the status quo. The polls, however, told a very different story. My pollsters told me that I was crazy to run, that there was no way that I could win, but I ran anyway. And in 2012, I became an upstart in a New York City congressional race. I swore I was gonna win. I had the endorsement from the New York Daily News, the Wall Street Journal snapped pictures of me on election day, and CNBC called it one of the hottest races in the country. I raised money from everyone I knew, including Indian aunties that were just so happy an Indian girl was running. But on election day, the polls were right. 
and I only got 19% of the vote. And the same papers that said I was a rising political star now said I wasted $1.3 million on 6,321 votes. Don't do the math. It was humiliating. Now, before you get the wrong idea, this is not a talk about the importance of failure, nor is it about leaning in. I tell you the story of how I ran for Congress because I was 33 years old, and it was the first time in my entire life that I had done something that was truly brave, where I didn't worry about being perfect. And I'm not alone. So many women I talk to tell me that they gravitate towards careers and professions that they know they're going to be great in, that they know they're going to be perfect in. And it's no wonder why. Most girls are taught to avoid risk and failure. They're taught to smile pretty, play it safe, get all A's. Boys, on the other hand, are taught to play rough, swing high, crawl to the top of the monkey bars, and then just jump off headfirst. And by the time they're adults, and whether they're negotiating a raise or even asking someone out on a date, they're habituated to take risk after risk. They're rewarded for it. It's often said in Silicon Valley, no one even takes you seriously unless you've had two failed startups. In other words, we're raising our girls to be perfect, and we're raising our boys to be brave. Soljani believes that so many women nowadays live in fear of not being good enough, whether it's always having to put on a friendly face to everyone you meet or not being too critical of others for fear of being considered bitchy. Navigating the world as a woman is often an incredibly difficult task. This is what the author learned after her epic failure while running for Congress. Instead of letting it get her down, though, she bounced back with a new brave idea. Rather than serving the public via holding office, she founded Girls Who Code. The categorization of girls as agreeable, people pleasers starts as soon as they're born. One study that placed babies without recognizable genders in neutral clothes showed that when they are upset, adults were more likely to think they were boys. But when they were happy, most adults assumed the infants were girls. And this expectation of girls quickly develops into reality. Consider a University of California study involving a simple lemonade stand. The catch? Instead of adding sugar, the researchers added salt, making the beverage less than satisfying. After handing them out to groups of girls and boys, the results of the social conditioning girls go through become clear. Boys immediately conveyed how disgusting it tasted, whereas girls politely sipped it. Only after the researchers pressed the girls on why they kept drinking did the truth come out. The girls said they did not want the researchers to feel bad. This is a society we live in where boys are bred to be brave and girls to please via an endless drive towards perfection. Stanford psychologist Carol Dweck once famously said that if life were one long grade school, girls would rule the world. Getting straight A's in school isn't a bad thing, but the drive for perfection it results from doesn't translate well into adult life. The author's own life story reflects how bravery is a much more important trait than perfection. She was a straight-A student at school and went on to become a lawyer at a prestigious corporate law firm. But she hated her job. Her dream had always been to get involved in public service. When the 2008 Democratic nomination was announced, the author was distraught after finding out that her idol, Hillary Clinton, whom she extensively campaigned for, had lost to Barack Obama. But Clinton's concession speech helped the author realize that she needed to stop striving for perfection. One failure, Clinton proclaimed, doesn't mean we should give up on our dreams. So the author quit her corporate job and made a radical decision. She would run for Congress. While she failed miserably at doing so, the experience uncovered some myths of perfection that she herself had fallen for. One of these is that being impeccable on the outside will guarantee a perfect ending to every story. By masking her insecurities and flaws with pristine and a faultless stump speech, the author was convinced she'd be spared criticism from her opponents during her run for Congress. She quickly learned how wrong she was. Perfection wasn't what she needed. Bravery in the face of criticism was much more important. That isn't to say that the pressure to appear perfect isn't imaginary. As Clinton herself had remarked in 2008, 
While Obama could simply roll out of bed and into a suit, she had to spend hours getting her hair and makeup done for any public appearance. How we present ourselves does matter, but it isn't everything, and clinging on to the veneer of perfection instead of presenting a brave face won't help us get through the difficult situations that all women will eventually face in life. In 2016, the author gave a TED talk on the need for women to be brave. Unsurprisingly, while her talk received widespread praise, it was not without its detractors. Male keyboard warriors took to the comment section of her talk to mansplain that bravery is essentially a male trait thanks to evolution. Women, some of these misguided men explained, were simply not biologically fit to be brave and take risks. Such fallacious arguments are not new, but the Tarzan Jane view of men being fearless providers who risk their lives to go out into the wild to hunt while pregnant women stay in the safety of the cave is quite an outdated argument. Society has least changed a lot since then, to say the least. And the role of women in society has changed as well. While everyone has bad habits, they want to change. We all know that it's often easier said than done. Nevertheless, change is possible if we put our minds to it. This is particularly so when it comes to escaping the vicious cycle of constantly striving for unattainable perfection and replacing it with the habit of being brave. Luckily, there are a number of strategies that can help women develop a bravery mindset. And while attaining it doesn't happen overnight, it's not as difficult as you might think. The first and most important step in adopting the bravery mindset is to always keep your tank full. Many women that the author knows are perpetually exhausted from juggling the roles of employee, parent, housewife and chief household organiser. On top of all of that, they're always putting the needs of others first and striving for perfection. Essentially, modern womanhood is a recipe for burnout. Of course, it's extremely difficult to be brave when you're always on the verge of exhaustion. Being brave demands stamina, energy and endurance, hence the importance that women stay healthy, both mentally and physically. Make sure to get enough sleep, set aside time every day for meditation and keep up a regular routine at the gym, she says. By always keeping your tank full, you'll be ready to start putting the bravery mindset into practice. One way to do so is to set daily bravery challenges. For example, if you've always been afraid of speaking up at a meeting unless you're absolutely sure that it's an extremely astute observation, throw that out the window. Tell yourself that today. You're going to speak up at the meeting even if your idea might fall on deaf ears. The more bravery you practice, the easier it gets. Another challenge you could set yourself is to regularly ask for feedback from your peers. For women obsessed with perfection, Receiving criticism can be the last thing they want to hear, but if we're going to improve ourselves, then it's time to move outside the comfort zone. Instead of waiting for feedback, bravely invite it. Ask your colleagues about what you could do better. Over time, you'll enter a state of flow where you'll stay on the lookout for feedback in everything that you do, which will allow you to begin journeying down a road of constant self-improvement. Being brave entails higher risks, and with risk comes the possibility of failure. So it's important to know how to deal with failure, whether it's losing an election like the author did or bombing a job interview. The first thing to do after any failure is to let it all out. Spend a few days despairing, binge watching series and eating Ben and Jerry's, but three days maximum, because the next step after despairing is to celebrate your failure. If you failed at something, it means you at least had the bravery to try, and you need to celebrate that bravery even if trying didn't lead to success. Finally, it's time to review, reassess and realign. Figure out where you went wrong, what happened exactly, what could you have done better, what are the consequences of failure. Once you've reviewed the situation, reassess it from an external perspective. Try to step out of your own head and look at the situation through someone else's eyes. You might see things differently. The last step is to realign. Remember what drove you towards your failure in the first place. For the author, she wanted to make a difference by running for public office. When that failed, she chose another way to make a difference and launched Girls Who Code. So to sum up, Schaeffler says in The Perfectionist's Guide to Losing Control that perfectionism isn't a problem to be fixed. It's a power to be harnessed and used. Getting out of the cycle of self-punishment and shame can be difficult for perfectionists. The path is winding and there'll be missteps, which are not forgiven easily by perfectionists. However, by showing yourself compassion and connecting with others, the cycle can be broken. You can make your peace with perfectionism and make it work for you.
But it's important to remember this is an ongoing process. You must keep adapting to your perfectionism or else it will turn on you. It's like eating. You can't eat once a week and expect to stay full. You have to keep at it. So Johnny says in Brave, Not Perfect, that from an early age, girls are groomed to become people pleasers and perfectionists. This is in stark contrast to their male peers who are encouraged to make mistakes and get their hands dirty. These socially conditioned personality traits continue into adulthood, causing countless women to be held back in their personal and professional lives. By throwing out perfectionism and embracing the bravery mindset, however, women can protect themselves from burnout, achieve their dreams and band together so that women everywhere can prosper. I think perfectionism can be helpful if channeled appropriately. Schaeffler is right in saying that it isn't all bad, as ambition is important as long as it doesn't start taking over your life. At the same time, there needs to be ways to temper it so it's not in control of you. Please join in on the conversation following at how to be 24 7 on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook and subscribe on the podcast which can be found via www.howtobe247.com. Please do leave a review if you found this helpful and you want to be featured. Remember to check out Patreon for exclusive unseen bonus material from every single interview or for a price of a coffee and don't forget to check out the new website. Before we go, here are Lisa Grotz, who is an author, certified etiquette expert and Huffington Post blogger. She's also a former director of protocol for the city and county of San Francisco. And Michelle Folia, who is the author of Poppy's Miracle, coach and speaker on their thoughts. A lot of people think that if you're a perfectionist, it will hold you back in life. I disagree and consider it a good trait versus a personality flaw. God made us who we are. It's one thing if you have been medically diagnosed with, say, OCD or other types of behavioral disorders that are out of your control. I am a perfectionist. I am neat, organized, and I like to cross my T's and dot my I's. I also like to have my pillows chopped a certain way, but that doesn't make me a bad person or limit me whatsoever. Perfectionism wears many faces. Whichever one is yours, Wear it well. Be yourself and remember my three golden rules. Knowledge is power. Age comes with wisdom. And never downplay the gifts which you are given. The thing about perfectionism for me is that I thought I was a perfectionist for most of my life. I'm 48 now until I realized I I have ADHD, possibly autism too. And what I thought was perfectionism was actually my need for order and having a full picture in front of me and knowing all the steps one at a time. So I can't do a project unless I have every step in front of me and know what each step entails in every little detail. And then I can embark and do something. This was the case with my book, which is why it took me seven years to complete. So I now realize it wasn't perfectionism, it was a need to know everything in detail and in order.